Okay, hi. Uh, this is Hank Milstein, and uh, my special qualifications for doing this class is just that I've been a social activist, a socialist, and a member of the Communist Party USA for many years. And uh, so naturally, I'm interested in what Marx and Engels and Lenin have to say about the world. And I'm particularly interested in hearing what they have to say about the world beyond capitalism. What is it that we are struggling for? And, uh, you know, this is a question if you tell people I'm a communist or even just I'm a socialist, uh, people will immediately ask, well, you know, how is that going to work? What's it going to be like if we had socialism in the United States? What would it look like? Uh, now, one answer to that, which is perfectly legitimate, is we don't know what it'll look like because it's something that's going to develop. Uh, it's not going to come, we, we're pretty sure it's not going to come in the immediate future. So it will develop out of um, the development of capitalist society and the overthrow of capitalist society. And what emerges from that will depend very much on how that, uh, how things develop in whatever decades are left between now and the time that we begin to build socialism here. But it is possible to put out some ideas of what we mean by socialism. And in particular tonight, uh, tonight we're going to look at what we mean by a socialist state. Uh, or at least we're going to look at the ideas of Lenin, who depended very heavily, of course, on the ideas of Marx, on what a socialist state would look like, a working class state, or uh, as he spoke, used the term a proletarian state. Uh, and we'll see what relevance that has for us today and what uh, we can um, glean from that that will be helpful uh, in beginning to answer that question. So uh, the format for tonight is pretty simple. I'm going to uh, do a summary of the book, give you an idea of the content. I hope that some of you have read it, but if you haven't, please just listen and feel free to join in the discussion. And then I'm going to open it up for questions. I have some questions in mind that I think are naturally suggested by this material. And uh, if you have other uh, topics or other questions that you would like to bring up, of course, that's certainly possible. We are going to be we're running on, uh, on limited time here. Um, we try to get done in an hour, so I'm going to try to uh, keep my, um, my initial presentation down to no more than um, about 35 minutes. And so I will um, my um, clock working here. Um, and uh, I've set this for 35 minutes, so hopefully I can get, and I think I can get done enough. Uh, let me say a little bit about the book, Lenin and the State of Revolution. Uh, it was initially written mostly in 1914, so several years before the October Revolution. Uh, it was actually uh, not completed, at least in its present form, until right before the October Revolution. And Lenin was, in fact, working on a final seventh chapter to the book on the experience of the Russian revolutions when the October Revolution, the Socialist Revolution, the Working Class Revolution in, in Russia took up all his time. And so he said, uh, more uh, profitable to actually go through a revolution than just to write about one. But he did write about what he, what he believed about the process of revolution and of what, the, at least as far as he could foresee, what the outcome of that would look like in terms of a revolutionary working class state. The book was written in particular to answer some opportunist ideas that were very common in the left wing, in the Marxist movement at that point, or people who were trying to be Marxist, who thought they were Marxist, but were saying, basically, we can uh, take the, the bourgeois state machine, the state machine as it exists with the parliament and uh, the executive and the judiciary and all the bureaucracy, and all we need to do is to elect uh, some socialists to the leading positions in that structure and we'll build socialism. 
And Lenin's book, on one of the main thrusts of Lenin's book is to say that is impossible because the this bourgeois state structure bourgeois rule, the rule of the bourgeoisie, the capitalist class over against the working class. So you have to smash, he uses that word smash, actually, literally. Uh, in Russian, Russian word is, but he's very bad about smash or abolish. The bourgeois state machine exists, establish something completely new. So uh, he starts. Hank, something is happening with your computer. Yeah. Uh, maybe that you're moving around, uh, uh, but uh, also when you hold your head down, your uh, mic for some reason becomes very uh, muffled. And oh. so uh, we might just okay. wanna, yeah. Uh, but it's not, it's not too, it's not very bad. It's just that it happens on occasion, especially when you hold your head down and move around uh, because your the energy of your computer is being used a lot with the webcam, the mic, the speakers, and the and the uh, PowerPoint. So the less uh, movement uh, uh, will help. Okay, okay, no, no problem. Thank you for letting me know. Okay, so what is the state in Marx's terms? In chapter one, Lenin goes into that and he uh, says. The state is a product and a manifestation of the irreconcilability of class antagonisms. He relies very heavily at this point on um, uh, the uh, on Engels, uh, and Engels uh, wrote a book, *The Origin of Private Property: uh, The Family and the State*. And Engels points out the state as we know it today is something that didn't always exist. It didn't exist in pre-class society, in hunter-gatherer or even in early agricultural society. There was no state. Uh, everybody was armed and everybody participated in deciding what the community was going to do. Um, but when classes developed with one class owning the means of production and the other, other classes working it and producing profit, um, that kind of situation of uh, equality or what Marx called primitive communism could not continue and so you began to have a state emerged that was precisely designed in order to enable the ruling class to hold down the classes beneath it. And so you have the state as an instrument of class rule uh, developing a standing army and police forces um, uh, that separates itself, separates the state from the mass of the people. And um, Lenin is very emphatic that a state is an instrument for the rule of one class over other classes, for imposing the will of a ruling class on other classes. It's a what, what he calls a specific organization of force designed to enforce class divisions and class relationships and class hierarchy. Um, uh, so, uh, the bourgeois state is the rule of the bourgeoisie. This is, by the way, aimed at some um, opportunists and others who are saying the state is, uh, a, is a means of reconciling classes and, and uh, um, aims to be led following both Marx and Engels says, no, that is not true. It's not a matter of reconciling classes because the classes have irreconcilable interests. You know, the profit that is gleaned by the ruling class depends on ripping off essentially to holding down the wages and conditions of the working class. So there's no possibility within capitalism of reconciling the two classes and the state exists precisely to keep down the working class. Now, Lenin also says uh, this is the last quote on this page here. Our democratic republic is the best possible political shell for capitalism. And therefore, once capitalism has gained possession of this very best shell, it establishes its power so securely, so firmly that no change of persons in 
political parties, the board will have democratic vote and shake it. Now that's full of a lot of content. One thing, why would a democratic republic be a good political shell for capitalism? It would seem to be the opposite. If you have democracy and everybody voting, universal suffrage, then that would seem to indicate that, well, you know, the majority of people, when the working class becomes the majority, then they'll be the majority of the electorate. They'll establish working class rule with a democratic republic. And of course, what, what uh, Lenin points out particularly is that the democratic republic, so-called, that exist under capitalism are really controlled by capital. And we see that, you know, I, I don't think there's much to argue about that uh, today. We see that in the role of money in, uh, in American political life. I mean, and everybody, pretty much everybody realizes that. People who are, you know, miles away from our political outlook, outlook realize that. Polls show that people realize that. And precisely because there's a facade of democracy and some degree of democracy, uh, that would camouflage his capitalist class rule and so actually makes it much more secure. But it also means that you can't use the machinery the, of the capitalist state to build socialism. In other words, you can't just elect a bunch of socialists uh, as president or in, in the Congress and expect that by itself that's going to result in being able to build socialism. As long as you have a bureaucracy, we'll talk about that a little bit more, a bureaucracy that is unelected and that conducts the real business of state, uh, behind the scenes of the, you know, the parliament or Congress or whatever representative institution you have. And as long as you have money, being able to buy elections essentially, and being able to control uh, that bureaucracy, uh, you're not going to be able to build socialism. So those are the main points uh, that, uh, that Lenin makes. Lenin also makes the point uh, that uh, the state, the state will wither away, but it's a proletarian state that will wither away. There were some opportunists who were saying, well, Lenin, Marx said that the state will wither away. So the bourgeois state, if we can just get positions in the bourgeois state, get political positions in the bourgeois state, then the state, the bourgeois state will start to wither away. And, and Lenin points out very emphatically, that's not what Marx said. Marx said you have to abolish the bourgeois state, establish a proletarian state, and that will begin to wither away. Why will it wither away? Because the state, as we already explained, is a mechanism for imposing the rule of one class over another class or other classes. When we are no longer have one class imposing its rule over others, when the working class has taken power, and is least moving towards the abolition of class distinctions, then the state will naturally wither away because the state as a state depends on the need for one class to hold down another. Um, we'll talk about that more a little bit later as, as uh, Lenin continues. So what do we mean by a proletarian state? This is what Lenin begins to address in chapter two. Now Lenin is very clear that a state by its nature is a special organization of force. This isn't a very comfortable thing to think about, is it? Uh, but they, that's exactly what a state is. A state is a mechanism which forces, ultimately has a monopoly on force, a monopoly on violence, the instruments of violence, uh, and therefore can hold down the population. Uh, this is this is very this is commonplace legal doctrine. Uh, the government, you, you if you try to form your own private army, you're going to get yourself in some pretty hot water legally right away. Uh, if you try to form your own police force, uh, you're going to get in trouble right away. Unless, of course, you happen to be a capitalist, and then you can establish private security forces. But if you try, if you're, you know, the general population decides, well, we don't like what the police are doing, we're going to establish our own police, and you're going to be in trouble real soon because the government, the state, claims a monopoly on the use of organized force. And that's true for any kind of state. It's also true for the proletarian state. We'll see why in a moment. The proletarian state is the proletariat 
organized as the ruling class. It is more undivided power directly backed by the armed force of the people. Okay, now what's what's going on there? What is Lenin saying? Lenin is saying that to establish a revolutionary state, a working class state, what the working class has to do is directly attack the monopoly of force, of organized force by the state and establish the working class, the people generally, as enforcing their will, which implies, and this is something that uh, we'll discuss the, um, uh, in a few minutes, we'll discuss the uh, Paris Commune. This is something the Paris Commune did. Basically, they had a militia that comprised the whole only male population because, of course, they were still uh, influenced by all the male, so all the male workers, working class people, or the majority in Paris, uh, were part of the militia, and they would serve for a day or two at a time on a rotating basis. But everybody, every male, was expected to put in time as part of the militia. There was no militia or police separate from the people. And this is what Lenin says is necessary. Now, you know, this may make the pacifists among us very uncomfortable, and I understand uh, that, and I feel you know, in a way it's uncomfortable for me too, but uh, there's a considerable truth to what Lenin says, that a state is an organization of force, and that to break through, to smash that state, you need to have the force, force that's ultimately dependent on the people, and not just on you know, a selected professional group of uh, people who are authorized to use violence. Um, so that's what that's what Lenin's thinking is on smashing the state. Um, and this is what creates in Lenin's uh, understanding and also in Marx's understanding uh, the dictatorship of the proletariat. Now dictatorship we don't generally use that term anymore because you know, particularly in the 20th century dictatorship got associated with fascist dictatorships and then of course in anti-communist thinking that was associated with communist dictatorships and it's a very tricky term so we have to do some thinking about what what Marx and Engels and Lenin meant when they used that term dictatorship of the proletariat uh, we've already seen that a state exists for the suppression of one class by another. Now, a working class revolution means that the working class is going to take over the ownership and control of the means of production. So it's going to abolish the bourgeoisie, essentially. But that's not going to happen all at once. Um, for one thing, it may not be possible for economic reasons, for organizational reasons, for the working class immediately to to take over all of the means of production. For some time, there may be means of production that will remain in the hands of the, of the former bourgeoisie. And the bourgeoisie itself, the people who are in the bourge, part of the bourgeois class, the capitalist class, the one percenters, whatever you want to call them, they're not going to just disappear. And contrary to popular belief, we're not just going to massacre them. We'll try to win them over. But, you know, in most cases, they'll be pretty upset about what's happening, they're not gonna like it. So the proletarian state, the working class state, the working class is gonna have to hold down those people and prevent them from overthrowing socialism. And of course we see, we've seen how socialism can in fact be overthrown. Um, and ultimately that means that force might be necessary or the threat of force, or possibly outright force, if, as happened, of course, in Soviet Russia, uh, the ruling class, and uh, in the case of Russia, the uh, foreign interven intervention brought about a civil war. So what Lenin means by the dictatorship, it's dictatorial in the sense it's dictatorial towards the minority, towards the bourgeoisie, the capitalist class, but it's the height of democracy for the new ruling class, which is the proletariat. So what does Lenin um, think about what the, uh, um, what a proletarian state will look like? Now, he realizes that he can't predict this in detail. 
that there will be many different forms of working class state when it finally develops, but there are some generalities that can be said. I'm gonna go to the second point uh, on this uh, page here. This, uh, the dictatorship of the proletariat is the fullest democracy possible. And its features are the abolition of the standing army and also the police to be replaced by the armed people. All officials will be paid workers' wages and they will be elected and subject to recall. Uh, in other words, there won't be any possibility of your getting cushy or highly prestigious uh, or very powerful positions in political office um, because you're going to be you'll be treated as an employee, an employee of the working class, and you're going to get no more pay than you know uh, an average skilled worker would get. Not only that, but you are not only elected, but you're subject to recall at any time. There are and to of various sorts, in economy and technology, and so on and so forth. Uh, sure, you will have those. You may not be able to get rid of bureaucracy all at once, but all administrative workers will be directly responsible to officials who are directly elected and subject to recall. Um, which means that this is what Lenin, the way Lenin puts it, there's going to be an abolition of, parl of what he calls parliamentarism. And what does he mean by that? Um, he's relying here very heavily on Marx's analysis of the um, Paris Commune, which Marx discusses at length in a work called The Civil War in France, which is a very important work to read on the subject. What was the Paris Commune? It was a, um, in the wake of the, of the Franco-Prussian War in 1870, 1871, as France was being defeated, the workers in Paris carried out a working class revolution. They took power. They seized control of their workplaces and they established a government, which was called the Commune, which relied, as I pointed out, on a militia, which comprised the whole working population, the whole male working population. Uh, and all of the um, it, officials were uh, elected and were subject to immediate recall on, uh, by the electors whenever they willed. And one of the things that Lenin, uh, Lenin points out, that Marx also points out, of course, is that the commune, this massive council of workers' representatives, um, like the Soviets in the in Russian Revolution, uh, was not purely a legislative body, it combined legislative and executive functions. That means it was responsible, the officials who were made the laws were responsible for carrying them out. They didn't pass them on to a group of unaccountable bureaucrats. This is very important because Lenin is very much in favor of the abolition of bureaucracy. Now he admits this is going to be a major struggle, and you may, may not be able to get rid of bureaucracy all at once. But bureaucracy is a major enemy for Lenin, and he devotes in his post, uh, you know, his writings after this, as the Soviet Union began to develop, uh, he devotes a major portion of his energy to combating bureaucracy. Um, so, now, one of the things that Lenin says, and this is something where I have a question that I'd like to raise and maybe some people have some insights into this. Lenin maintained that the development of capitalism has so simplified most state functions that they, quote, can be reduced to such exceedingly simple operations of registration, filing, and checking that they can be easily performed by every literate person. In other words, Lenin, he says this repeatedly, in fact, in his works, uh, to establish working class control of the economy, all that's needed, all that's needed is to make the uh, uh, enterprises state property, property of the working class state, and just uh, exercise very simple accounting and uh, control, which anybody can do. Uh, he puts it in one way, saying that any cook can learn to govern. Uh, this is one area, I have a lot of respect for Lenin, but this is one area where I've got a serious 
some serious questions about this. And of course, as I've been reading some of the later works of Lenin, uh, as Lenin and others, the Bolsheviks discovered, this was not so easy. And accounting, you know, doing the kind of accounting that was needed, it, it seems to me, let me put it bluntly, that this is a vast oversimplification, that the management of the economy is a lot more complicated um, than he's making it out to be, which means establishing working class control over the economy is a lot more complicated than he's making it out to be. And I wonder if this is not uh, part of the problem why the development of the Soviet Union and the other socialist states did not proceed in the way that uh, I think Lenin and other Bolsheviks had expected and hoped. But I'll leave that aside and we can just come back to that later. Okay. Let me see here. Okay. Um, now, Lenin points out in chapter four that the proletarian state is no longer a state in the proper sense, for instead of suppressing the majority, it, in the person of the I talk that a state exists to basically restate it exists to impose a mind the rule the state, a working class state, is really anomalous because it's the majority suppressing a minority that is already being deprived of its power because the working class is taking over the means of production, the wealth, the uh, investment capital, if you will, that is the source of the bourgeoisie's power, politically and economically. And here again, he points out the Paris Commune guarded against working, the working class state becoming a master over society rather than a servant by two measures. All officials of any sort are subject to election and recall, and all officials are paid workers' wages. Okay. He also points out, this is very interesting, when, when the state is finally eliminated, there won't be any democracy. Does that mean that there's not going to be any majority rule? On the contrary, majority rule will continue as long as there is human society, but democracy as a form of state will not exist because there won't be a state. Democracy implies state, a form of state. And he points out communists aim for a society in which there will be no violence against persons and no subordination. But he again points out that temporarily we do have to have the possibility of force and even violence to put down the, the resistance of the ruling class that we have overthrown. Um, in chapter five, he goes in, into the uh, uh, economics and the economic basis for the ultimate withering away of the state. He's very careful to point out that the withering away of the working class state is going to be a lengthy process. It's not something that's going to happen quickly at all. And you certainly can't do it willfully and just abolish the state as the anarchists were saying. Uh, there will be a prolonged period, which is what is normally called socialism in, uh, in Marxist parlance and Marxist vocabulary, where the motto for distribution is from each according to her ability to each according to her work. So work is, uh, is the measure of the, the goods that you get, the salary you get, the privileges you get, uh, which means it's not fully equal and not fully just according to Lenin's thinking. Um, but this is, this is what's necessary as people develop, a number of things I think are at play here. Um, people have to learn um, to work uh, for the betterment of society and to see that by working for the good of society, they're working for their own good because they're part of society. So there's an appeal to self-interest, but it's self-interest uh, in terms of um, social uh, seeing that you are uh, you are part of a society that is all working together for the common good, including your own good. Um, and also, of course, I think this is true of Marx and Engels and Lenin. Um, they were very awed by the progress that technology had made in their time. And they believed that in the not too distant future, uh, Marx talks about this, uh, work 
drudgery work, uncreative work, unfulfilling work will be basically will be unnecessary. And, you know, we're beginning to get an idea of how that might work with uh, the development of computer technology, artificial intelligence, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, ultimately, you'd have a situation where all work would be creative, all work would be fulfilling, and so you wouldn't have to force people to work. You certainly wouldn't have to force them by force, but you wouldn't even have to force them by saying, well, you know, if you put in 10 hours of work, you get 10 hours wages. People would want to work because they would find, find ways of working that they found fulfilling and satisfying. Um, Lennon also points out, however, um, that, oh, they also, he also points, uh, Marx and Engels and then Lenin pointed out that ultimately there's not going to be an antithesis between mental and physical labor. There's not going to be, um, the division of labor that we now know. Uh, I think Marx puts this in one, in one point by saying, you know, uh, in the morning I might decide to be a fisherman, in the, in the afternoon a sculptor, in the evening I might decide to be a poet, you know. And I could do that in a fully developed communist society. So this is the kind of, it, it sounds utopian, but it's, it's based on some, uh, some rational thinking. But it's also something for, I think we can all understand, something for the distant future. And Lenin points out that the concern about that distant future must not obscure the vital and burning question of present day politics, namely the expropriation of the capitalists, the conversion of all citizens into workers, and other employees of one huge syndicate, the whole state, and the complete subordination of this, of the entire work of the syndicate to a genuinely democratic state, the state of the Soviets of workers and peasants and soldiers, deputies. Um, so that's, and, and what's going to happen, Lenin believes, he goes into this in chapter six, um, under socialism, all will govern in turn and will soon become accustomed to no one governing. I think this is a capsule statement of how he envisages the um, withering away of the state. Um, now, of course, we know that the development of the Soviet Union and other socialist states uh, did not proceed as, as, what should I say, as smoothly as this might imply. In fact, there proved to be major difficulties, major setbacks, uh, and you know, major horrors and, and wrongs that were committed that you know, violated the principles that Lenin set out. So that's something worth considering, you know, what, uh, what caused that. I'd rather not get into a discussion of that right now because that's a huge subject uh, in itself. But I'd like to go back. Uh, I would like to open things now. Well, before we go into this, what I'd like to do, I, I covered this in a great hurry. The book is a very rich book, and if you have not read it, I recommend reading it. And if you have read it, I recommend reading it again, um, because more things come to you the more you read it. Um, but I'd like to open the floor, Dee, if, if I could, just for people who have questions or want some clarification, strictly clarification about what I have presented. Okay, uh, uh, Hank has indicated he'd like to open the floor now for questions of, uh, concerning the material that was presented. If you'd like to introduce a question at this point, please use the pic please click the picture of the uh, raised hand please use, uh, click the raised hand icon and indicate you, you have a question you'd like to put on the floor. Okay, I'm scrolling through and I will open your mic. Cameron Bateman, you now need to open your, click your mic on your end. There you are. I just had a question more about the presentation of the material and the material itself. I just, it, maybe it's just me, but, or a personal perspective. It's certainly a personal perspective, but I'm not sure why we apologize for the, or trip over ourselves to apologize for the Soviet Union uh, all the time when the reality is that every state has a complicated history, some more complicated than others, but they were a wonderful counterweight in the world to imperialism for a long time, seven decades, 
and achieve things that uh, the rest of capitalists and even social democratic societies still haven't achieved. Okay, well, I understand that. Um, as I say, I don't want to get into that uh, that discussion too much, but uh, thank you for your contribution. Okay, Jake, your mic is open. Jake Wyatt. Jake Wyatt, your mic is open. Your hand is up. Okay. Anyone else have a, okay, just a moment. Ken, your mic is open. Now click your mic on your end, please. I clicked it. Ken. Go on, Ken. Yes, yes, now. Just heard you. Excellent. Yes, comrades, sisters, and brothers. Um, looking at the state and revolution. A number of people who were anarchists ended up in the Soviet Revolution. I take it for granted that they were proponents of having a elimination of the state immediately. Those people. But I don't know. To be yeah, yeah. Were they were they actually saying that? Say Kalantai and those personnel. And if we were to do this here in the United States, what would be the implications of having a worker state come into being that would also include other factions or forces? Or would we look at the possibility of having a one party state here in the United States as a more efficient form? Well, of course, I again, this is impossible to predict. I don't know. Um, I myself uh, don't believe that a one party state uh, is, any, is that we're going to have that or that that will be a good thing uh, for the United States. Uh, but that's, um, you know, we don't know since that uh, that is one thing that Lenin points out that there will be many different forms. Uh, of a wor of a working class state, and they will have certain things in common, but they will also, in some respects, look very different. So it's difficult to predict, or really impossible to predict. Angel, your mic is open. Thank you, comrade. Greetings from Mexico, comrades. I just have a small question about procedure here. Um, right here, where I'm reading the part about a democratic republic, in which it, in which it mentions mm -hmm. that. It's created in order to establish a well-known power to the bourgeoisie and to stop like this power from being taken away from from the oppressors. Uh, my question here is: How do you comrades work in in the United States in order to elevate the consciousness of the proletariat for them to know that it's necessary to completely destroy the the the, the idea of the democratic republic inside the bourgeoisie? in order to have a real democratic republic inside a proletariat dictatorship. Thank you, comrades. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's a that's an excellent, that really is, is a question that I was going to, to raise. So let's let's go on to a discussion of this. Um, I think there are two parts to it. First of all, I mean, um, do we agree that a democratic republic, that the democratic, the bourgeois democratic state that we have is in essence the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie and that it's fundamentally, you can't just reform it, you have to really tear it down and build something new. I mean, are we, are we agreed on that? There are people who, you know, consider themselves socialists and are very sincere in being socialists uh, who believe that, yes, if we can get a solid socialist majority in Congress and a socialist in the White House, that we can begin to build socialism without uh, too much modification without maybe even, you know, maybe some amendments to the Constitution, but keeping the basic uh, structure that people are accustomed to. I mean, do do we believe that that is possible? Uh, and if not, then, you know, 
this question is important for us right now because I think most of us or all of us are aware that our party's position right now is that the most immediate task part of the working class is beating back the ultra-right, which of course is in control of the federal government and many state governments as well. And this entails electoral politics, it entails working with the Democratic Party, which is still a capitalist party, although it contains working class elements within it. Uh, and so, but it's definitely involves working within the framework of the bourgeois democratic system. And so the question arises, first of all, if, if we accept that, that is necessary at this point, then working within that, how do we do that? Work within the electoral system, while also, as we have the op as much as we have the opportunity, beginning to educate people that we need to go beyond the system we the state system we have and establish a new kind of state. You know, how do we combine the two? Um, the two goals of the immediate goal of pushing back the ultra right in the electoral arena, and also pointing out. Um, growing the knowledge among people that ultimately we need to replace the current straight state structure with something radically different. So I'd appreciate anybody's insights into that. And any reflection on the question of, you know, to what extent could we begin to build socialism using the state structure we have? Alvaro, your mic is open. Uh, yes, Henry, I uh, was going to uh, uh, address the question you had concerning the uh, how how a uh, modern uh, developed country like the United States uh, would make it easier to uh, be able to control the economy. Um, I've been working in the petro petrochemical industry for about 40 years and uh, Lennon is correct, and it is highly concentrated and highly organized already. Most of production in this country is done by uh, public corporate monopoly corporations. Public only in the sense that they're highly regulated uh, corporations where they have a board of directors and, and, and they're, they're restricted structures. But the problem that I see though in present society is that the majority of the functionaries, the uh, high level employees, the chief, uh, chief executive officers, the financial uh, chief financial officers, the top uh, board of directors and others, they're heavily influenced by capitalist ideology and they will not go gently into the night. And so I, I agree with you in that respect that if that part of it is gonna be more difficult, the rest of it, I think is pretty well organized and it, we just need macroeconomic uh, controls such as done presently through the Federal Reserve Board and others but uh, it only relatively it's easier than a developing country that's my mm -hmm. comment Good. thank you now yeah, it sounds very plausible I live in the middle of Silicon Valley so I'm in the middle of you know, highly technologized industry here Arthur, your mic is open. Arthur, your mic is open. You just closed, there you are. You just closed your mic. Bob Rossi, your mic is open. Hi. You just you yes. Okay. Uh, it was an excellent presentation. Uh, we're here. Uh, one of us is a retired state worker, and I organized state workers for like, 20 years. Um, and I think this question that you raise about can every cook govern is really important and fundamental. And we're thinking that the state looks a lot different now than it did in Lenin's time. Provides different services and does different kinds of research and enforcement. Um, I, we think that maybe the part of the solution is, is doing more training um, and put, making sure that the universities are under such control that people can come into that, workers can come into that work. 
and take over all of those functions. We're also thinking that putting state agencies under the same kind of workers control that we would uh, other factories and um, uh, points of production is, is part of that mix. What do you think about that? Well, I think that that's definitely, yeah, I think that's an excellent point. Uh, one thing I didn't discuss and didn't emphasize in the presentation, which maybe I should have, is the whole issue of workers control, because Lenin uh, insisted, and this was actually carried out in the Soviet Union from very early on, was to establish workers control even of the uh, capitalist enterprises. And for the state-owned enterprises, there was still workers control over, you know, considerable degree of workers control. Um, and uh, Lenin thought this was absolutely essential to building socialism. And certainly uh, it should apply to, you know, workers in, in government state functions. Um, Lenin was very, very emphatic about that. Cameron, your mic is open. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Really great, really great presentation. Um, I um, <clears throat> I feel like uh, this is um, in um, like uh, Lenin's work is important for understanding like um, and understanding the relationship between working class movements um, and the army and the police is important for the successes and failures of revolutionary struggles um, in Russia, Venezuela, uh, Chile, and other places, um, and even, uh, I think, Brazil right now. Um, <clears throat> um, and I'm, I, my perspective is uh, it's important to be important even uh, today for understanding um, and, you know, incorporating into our a struggle against the right wing in the US. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, I guess I have, uh, that's kind of my thinking, and I'm wondering what your are um, in terms of, um, like, what movements do you see today? I'm um, addressing some of these questions in terms of uh, confronting um, the power of the state, as well as, you know, electoral struggle and other forms of grassroots struggle. Um, in my mind, the for instance, the, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement, um, especially some of the demands being raised for community of control of police seem very important. Um, and uh, in, in addition to that, I'm, I'm wondering um, how you see uh, transition from or coordination between today, between a parliamentary struggle, struggle against the, the state, um, or and maybe how important is it for the party today to be thinking about uh, these things in the fight against the right and to prepare uh, for future stages of struggle. I don't know if um, that's making sense. Yeah, no, I understand. I have a number of questions there. Um, you know, one thing uh, one th I'd like to uh, say something about uh, one point you made, uh, the relationship between parliamentary or electoral struggle and the one and other forms of struggle. I think what we're seeing today, and this is very heartening to me, and I think to others, um, is a real blossoming of people's movements that are definitely electoral, that participate in the electoral process and work with the Democratic Party, but are uh, not simply instruments of the Democratic Party, uh, that they have their own independence, and that they, um, see the absolute importance of electoral struggle to beat back the ultra-right, but also see beyond that to other kinds of reforms and changes that are needed. So they're really um, combining electoral struggle with other forms of struggle, which I think is, is absolutely what we need. And in terms of the party, you know, what we should be doing, uh, I don't think we should become consumed um, with Know, trying to imagine what socialism is going to be like in our country, but I certainly think that thinking ahead to future stages of struggle and doing some thinking about, um, you know, what socialism is would be like in America, what we could accomplish with socialism, 
and how it could fit in with our democratic and civil libertarian um, traditions. I think that there's, that's worth doing some thinking about, not getting consumed by it, but doing some thinking about it so that when people ask about it, we can say, yeah, well, here are some of our ideas. We do have some, we're thinking about it. We don't think that we can have, we have, we're not going to have a blueprint, but we do have some ideas about what we want to see in a future socialist USA. David, your mic is open. So, Sayo, I actually found this, excuse me, I have a bit of a cold today. <clears throat> I found this presentation actually very helpful to me. Um, my question is actually related to this. Chavez asserted the state as the last rescuer of the people, rejecting this idea of having it, the state as an active role um, as the liberator of the proletariat by this presentation has helped me better understand actually my friends in the CPV and their critiques on this and also kind of how the present circumstances that Venezuela is in came about, which I, I'd be interested though in hearing your perspective on this. Uh, somebody else who knows the Venezuelan situation better than I do really should answer that. I mean, that's, uh, I, I am not sufficiently familiar to give a really intelligent response. So if anybody else has something to say on that, please speak up. Just a moment. Lowell, Denny, your mic is open. Thank you, Dee, as usual, for hosting this. Um, I can't answer about Venezuela, but instead of asking the question I'm trying to formulate, I'm going to make it as a statement and see what um, Mr. Milstein thinks of what I'm alleging or my thesis about Africa in particular. Um, I'm, I want to, I want to say that this work does not apply to a country to a country i apologize to a continent like africa because of its colonial history um the countries that were formed and i put countries in quotation marks and the nation states that were formed were literally drawn by outside actors with other designs on the continent so my thesis, if you will, is that this work does not apply to Africa. And then to ask Mr. Milstein, what are the implications of that? And if this is true, are there any implications for the African diaspora, i.e. Blacks who are in the United States who are struggling with white workers? Um, does our predicament because of that history differ? I hope that's clear. Thank you. Yeah. Well, again, I, uh, I'm also not very knowledgeable about Africa. I certainly am aware of the history of colonialism uh, in throughout the con that continent and elsewhere, of course, too. Um, but obviously, now Lenin, of course, is thinking and in this writing this book. I mean, it is. Uh, responding to certain concrete situations. He's thinking primarily of Europe and the United States um, and, uh, and of more or less developed capitalist societies. And of course, in other societies, particularly those that have been colonized, you may have very different situations. Uh, you will still have class divisions. You will have, of course, an international ruling class or international capitalist class or imperialist class. And then you will have a local capitalist class. Um, but there are going to be all sorts of complications um, uh, in the interrelationship of those different classes, even the different branches, if you will, of, of, of capitalist classes, the local versus the, or the indigenous versus the international or foreign. Uh, so, 
yeah, I mean, some of this may not seem directly applicable. I think the basic principles of, you know, a working class, now Lenin was talking about, was of course always had in mind primarily Russia, which did not have a majority of working class people, you know, in, in developed capitalist countries today, uh, the working class is clearly the majority. But in Lenin's time in Russia, uh, the working class was not the majority. The majority were small peasants. And uh, that posed all kinds of complications. Um, but Lenin still believed that the working class could be, and indeed had to be, the leader of, of a genuine revolution. Because only the working class really had, uh, this of course goes back to Marx, the working class had its hands on the levers of power because it had its hands on the levers of, of the power of production. Um, so that's a basic Marxist principle. Now, how you work that out concretely in different situations uh, can get, it can get indeed very complicated. But uh, I think there are some basic principles that are still worth attending to, that the role of a working class, even in Africa, uh, is going to be important and central in some way. And how that manifests uh, itself, again, I would have to have much more knowledge of the uh, specific situation in different African countries to be able to speak to that intelligently. Alvaro, your mic is open. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Dee, I, I, I did not ask to speak. You did. Your hand is up. Anyway, thank oh, you, I, Alvaro. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. All right, let's see. Um, Okay, that's pretty much it. And we're running out of time. So do you want to make any summary uh, remarks? Um, well, Hank? I would just like to say that I hope that this discussion is the beginning of a discussion in our party about how we see a future of Socialist USA and thinking about, you know, how this work here it's a brilliant piece of work, uh, the world considerably since then. So I think Lenin would be the last person to say, oh, you can just take what I said there and, you know, just rubber stamp it for the present. Obviously, we have to think about, you know, there are some basic principles here which apply, but we have to think how they apply in our pleasant present situation. And uh, I think, uh, although I don't, would not like to see the party get consumed by a discussion on this, I think a discussion of it is important and necessary because, you know, if we say we're a party of socialism, the next question people have is, well, what's socialism? What what would it look like? You know, what's in it for what's in it for us, for this country, if we had socialism? We need to be able to begin to give some answer to that, that makes sense and uh, appears realistic. So, uh, you know, continue your study. Uh, I would recommend that people who want to think about this question definitely look at The Civil War in France by Marx, which is the foundation for the, the book I've been talking about. And then look also at, uh, you know, later works of Lenin and other Marxists who have dealt with the question of the, uh, uh, the socialist state and how that works. Uh, and people, who, including people who had some arguments with Lenin, like I, I like particularly, I would recommend reading Rosa Luxemburg who engaged with some real dialogue with Lenin on how the, uh, the Bolshevik revolution was proceeding and some problems that she saw uh, in some of Lenin's ideas. So uh, that's basically what I have to say and let's continue the discussion. Okay, thank you, Hank, and thank you everyone for participating.